Hi, this is your host, Sabdun Bhartia, and welcome to TFR Let's Talk. And today we have with us once again, Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of Rec. And Rob, it's great to have you back on the show. Swap, it is a pleasure as always. And Rob, today we are going to talk about, you know, 10th anniversary of Kubernetes. First of all, tell us a bit about, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you can just go through the memory lane. When Kubernetes was announced, when CNCF was created as an anchor project, what was your first immediate reaction back then? Oh my goodness. I, I had the good fortune to actually being being in the room at the OzCon event where they first announced Kubernetes. Um, and, and it was this very sort of clunky, uh, interesting idea that had a lot of YAML. Um, and I was like, you know, you have to remember when Kubernetes started, there were, you know, you couldn't swing a cat by the tail without hitting a Kubernetes or a container, container project. Um, and there were already some very interesting ones on market that we were expecting to be the dominant choices here, right? Docker had, had Swarm already out. Um, Cloud Foundry was actually a very interesting contender. Um, it wasn't clear that Docker containers were going to be the thing that they, they have the default uh, choice that we have seen. None of that was set. What what I was watching was some very early pioneers doing demos where they showed spinning up an application using YAML files. And so that that demo, those first demos were literally command line demos where you took a YAML file and you loaded a pod and it showed that you had, you know, you could you could take a YAML file and then run an application. And that doesn't seem like a big deal 10 years later, but at the time being able to to send a YAML file in and just let that be your description of what your application was, it was it was actually very impressive then. And then added to that, we would do things like shut down machines, and you could see Kubernetes automatically draining the pods and switching the pods over and doing something like that. So at the moment in time, ten years ago, there were certain platforms as a service offerings. There were actually a lot of them, but none of them were particularly compelling from a way to describe what your application would look like. And so Kubernetes really captured the zeitgeist that, that Docker containers had captured, where you could have a simple description of what you wanted, feed that into the system, and produce the outputs you wanted. Uh, and so it, it was really groundbreaking from that perspective uh, without being overly prescriptive. The, the alternatives could do similar things like that, but a lot of cases, they only could do it for one or two types of applications. Uh, Kubernetes showed a lot of promise for being a bit more flexible. In all of these years, of course, you know, it, it's a big story, it's in production. I mean, we used to talk about, hey, you know what, it's just maturing, getting closer. It started with stateless, then a stateful workload. How has it evolved over time where you're like, you know what, just like Linux kernel, it started to solve a different problem. It was different, you know, because Borg was only running inside at uh, Google. So it's not, you know, <laughs> some random Finnish guy came up with the technology that changed the world. But how you have seen the evolution of Kubernetes from when it was created to solve that problem, or you're like, you know what, those foundations that is still the same. It is very mature, very you know, powerful technology, uh, which is doing what it was created to do. Or if I'm like, hey, it has evolved over time. It's a really fascinating question because I think there's components with Kubernetes that have been very true to the original vision, and 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 we have incrementally improved it, right? I think adding storage and networking controls, we we could see those coming from the very beginning. The thing that I've really found surprising from an evolutionary perspective is the CRD pattern. The ability to do custom resource definitions is not something that was anticipated in the original definitions of Kubernetes, but have become just absolutely essential for how people are using and consuming. And what I expect to see consumption patterns in Kubernetes in the future are going to be much more tied into this idea that, that you can define custom services in Kubernetes, build uh, containers that maintain those services or deliver those services, and then you create an ecosystem around those patterns. Uh, so I think, you know, when you look back on Kubernetes, that whole CRD pattern, that whole resource consumption model was not, not really the architectural vision that people 
thought that it was really about container management and making it easier to run containers. Kubernetes being able to actually, you know, sort of uh, inventory list and then manage the services in this uh, declarative pattern, that has been much more game changing for the industry, um, I think, than even the Kubernetes system itself. And so I, that that I think people. Um, inside the community, understand it. Outside the community, they miss just how significant those architectural patterns will be. This is a forward-looking statement. Uh, I, I think we're just at the beginning of understanding how to consume that architecture. Um, so it's been much more impactful than people realize, not just as a platform, but also uh, driving a degree of architecture and how we build applications. What are some of the biggest challenges that you see the Kubernetes CNCF cloud native ecosystem faces today when it comes to running Kubernetes in production? And I'm not talking oh, about boy. just the complication part. <laughs> yeah, well, complexity is the problem. Um, uh, you know, if anybody says what's wrong with Kubernetes, the, the word complexity <laughs> is is sort of the answer, which is not a very satisfying answer. That's what I said. You know, everybody knows that. that. <laughs> no, I don't want to call yeah. complexity, but beyond that, I do think that the ecosystem is confusing for people, um, and so you know, I think the CNCF has done a really good job of making what I would call a. Um, uh, I, I like to th think of as a tailgate party. Um, I don't like the phrase big tent here because it's been used in, in in some ways in other places. I think of Kubernetes, um, the CNCF has created a tailgate party where people show up with a project and an idea. They put out a keg of beer and see if, if people if people like it or not. Um, and I think that that's been really exciting from a formation perspective. I think it's very confusing for uh, what does Kubernetes require? What do I have to build in? Um, it ends up making it a little bit um, a vendor. It means that the vendors show up with an opinion. They, they pick the projects they want to do, and then we end up with some opinionated distros, Kubernetes. I don't think that's a bad thing from a consumption perspective, but I think it's going to be harder to wrangle that into a um, preferred architecture choice. Uh, and Kubernetes might not need it, but I think some of the perceptions of, of complexity come back to this idea of not knowing which projects to pick, and the CNCF not wanting to pick winners and losers. Um, you know, picking winners and losers can be very risky and, and hard for a project, but at the same time, from a user's perspective, um, they like having winners picked for them. They like having opinionated components. Um, you know, and it's okay. Right now we see the vendors doing that. I think it's a challenge for CNCF to sort of be a place where you know projects show up. They might get it. They might get momentum. They might not. And it, you have the risk of people looking at a project as a CNCF project, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's adopted or usable. Uh, and that dilutes the power of what the brand is. Uh, so I, I think those are challenges as we look at how things are going. Um, you know, and, and I think it's still very difficult at, at RackN. We specialize in bare metal infrastructure and running core infrastructure practices and services. And I, I think we're still seeing that um, 10 years in, I spent a lot of time in my first years in the Kubernetes community trying to do um, system, system ops and um, operator focused work. And, you know, I, I don't feel like the, the community has made a lot of progress um, the way I would like to see it in standardizing operational practices, creating best operational practices. I think Kubernetes is still hard to run for people. Um, and so doing that well with standard practice in a secure way, um, you know, what we're always interested in is how do people do that on bare metal or lightweight virtualization so that they can have a flexible open system. Uh, those things I think are still challenging. Um, you know, RecN's showing up to try and help here and, and provide some real enterprise uh, support around self-managed Kubernetes and running it yourself. But, you know, that, that's not where I was hoping it would be when I was involved in the project at the beginning. With most technologies, of course, we can talk about things like an external mainframe, Unix. Uh, they have been around 30, 40 years and they are going to be around. But once in a while, we do talk, hey, what's next? What's next? Linux, you know, I mean, in terms of Linux, there are a lot of real-time operating systems that where Linux cannot be used. So Ziffer is there. There are 
tiny little kernels are their operating systems. So they are they are not exact replacement for the kernel, but for different use cases. We do once in a while hear a chatter, hey, Kubernetes is getting too complicated. It's too complex. These are the alternatives which are emerging. We can talk about assemblies and a lot of things we talk about. Are What's next? Or you're like, no, it is something similar to the kernel. Uh, that's very foundational, well done technologies. So yes, we will be looking at adjacent technologies, but not something that is going to replace Kubernetes. Or you're seeing, yes, there are a lot of use cases where we don't have to necessarily deal with this complexity. It's an excellent question. I am seeing Kubernetes more willingly adopted as sort of the infrastructure control plane. Uh, that that interest is increasing. So I, I do think there's an appetite for infrastructures that are have you know bare metal Kubernetes running Kubernetes as that primary control plane, whether it's for training AI training clusters and inferencing clusters, um, edge edge deployments places where we might not have thought of Kubernetes as being a system control plane. I do see us taking Kubernetes more as a de facto um, control plane in places that we might not have thought to do it in the past. Um, that'll probably take some tweaks for the system, but it's really gonna take us looking at how we uh, manage and deploy and, and integrate back into Kubernetes. One thing I would like to see it looking into the future that I haven't seen as much yet is companies really making the assumption that they're going to deliver software, assuming that they have access to Kubernetes infrastructure and clusters, right? I've, I've, I've held out for a long time this hope that we're going to see more ISVs, right? Independent software vendors who write software without worrying about the cloud infrastructure or hosting it as a SaaS, where they can say, if you have Kubernetes, you can spin up this application and maintain this application inside of your own clusters. Uh, so I, I keep hoping that as Kubernetes becomes even more ubiquitous, even more preferred, that we're going to see companies that are, are leveraging its ubiquity as a way to deliver software. That's something I wanted at the very early days. And we just haven't seen, um, because everybody's so excited to use SaaS deployments, uh, I believe with uh, AI training models and the and the need to protect your data and hold your data and assemble data into use you know useful ways. Some of that will be you know companies saying I, I want to take the work that I've been doing and not have it pulled apart into a whole bunch of SaaS applications and asking to consume software and and applications inside of the infrastructure via Kubernetes that they're already already running. Uh, that to me is a golden opportunity, uh, both for the ISVs who want to deliver it, don't don't need to have it as a SaaS, don't need to manage that, and as the companies that want to protect their data and actually have have that you know maintain jurisdiction over all of the the data that they're shipping through the system. So, uh, you know, there's tremendous opportunities as we see Kubernetes more deeply accepted, and it's not just Kubernetes here; it's actually containerization of of workloads and containerized approaches to deploying automation, automation and applications. Um, yeah, we're we're just you know, ten years seems like a lot of time, but we're really only at the beginning of people baking these types of patterns and deployment opportunities into their their delivery. Where is Racken in this Kubernetes cloud native ecosystem? Racken's been working in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, from very early days, we built three or four different Kubernetes install processes and patterns. Um, we even built a small Raspberry Pi uh, infrastructure using K3S called Edge Lab. Um, so we, we've been in and around this, this uh, community for quite some time. Uh, lately, what we've been focused on doing is building, trying to build better bare metal automation uh, and really focus on, on unique strengths that we're bringing in. So. Uh, integrating into OpenShift and OpenShift deployments, um, taking advantage of Red Hat Container Linux and container, you know, their, their Container OS and Immutable OS standards, uh, working to build and deliver a CAPI provider that has you know, a lot of the types of operational controls that we see customers asking for. Uh, so we've been making quite a big investment lately in how to help customers be productive doing Kubernetes work 
on their own self-managed infrastructure, taking Kubernetes much more deeply into those uh, in, into their environments in new and interesting ways. Uh, and some of that, frankly, is fueled by customers looking for alternatives to VMware Broadcom. Uh, that's worth mentioning. It's going to take a while for Kubernetes to be a replacement for, for, for VMware, a long, long while for that. But there's a lot of interest in doing that. And so I, I think what you're seeing is internal forces inside of Kubernetes, but also external forces that are driving customers to look for, you know, a really great self-managed experience. And that's what Rackham's all about. And so we've been making very significant investments there. And are excited to be be you know, really trying to engage in the Kubernetes community along those lines. Rob, once again, thank you so much for taking time out today and discussing this topic today. And as usual, I look forward to having you again on the show. Thank you. Swap. I'm looking forward to it. Ten years from now, we'll be doing our 20-year anniversary. 